Foundation for giving me this opportunity to help teach gross anatomical veterinary pathology. The four one-hour sessions that I will present today will each be in the form of a self-graded quiz. You will have 15 seconds to come to some type of conclusion before I give you my answer. I encourage you to consider a few key words when viewing a Kodachrome. And those are size, shape, color, position, symmetry, and contents. If you do not have organ or location identification, quickly do in your mind an autopsy. And sometimes when you think of a particular system, a light bulb will go on and you will identify the organ at that time. And then once you have organ or location identification, it's much easier to come to some conclusion as to what the lesion is. We'll start with the first slide. The question, morphological diagnosis. Answer, heterochromia iridis, I-R-I-D-I-S. Heterochromia means more than one color in a tissue that is expected to be of one color. If we had a dog here with just one iris that had two or more colors, that too would be heterochromia iridis. usually over the age of four years. Morphological diagnosis. Is there someone in control of the focus? Thank you. The answer, metastatic melanoma to the brain and this represents the pituitary. A metastatic melanoma to the brain. The key here is that there are multiple lesions that are gray to black. And they are located in areas where the circulation deep within the brain decreases and where the circulation from meninges decreases, and we call that the border zone. So multiple lesions in the border zone would suggest a metastatic lesion. The color, which is the key here, just like it was in the first Kodachrome, would suggest to you that you'd have to consider either blood or melanin. Formalin fixed blood is brown. Fresh blood is red. The color here is gray-black. I would accept metastatic melanoma to the brain. Cat, morphological diagnosis. Once more, color is the key to the diagnosis. The answer is porphyria. 
femur, tibia, and fibia. Remember, a morphological diagnosis, if it is a good one, will reveal to the listener what is on the screen. Or I say to those I teach, close your eyes. Does your morphological diagnosis indicate what is on the screen? What condition is associated with this photograph? Not in all cases, but in many cases. two colors, blue eyes and white hair coat, would indicate that this kitten would have a chance of having deafness. The lesion responsible would be hypoplasia of the organ of cordy. So the answer was deafness. Canine morphological diagnosis. Color and symmetry. You recognize that the right optic nerve is smaller and gray. So the answer is atrophy of the right optic nerve. There would also be a gliosis as well as atrophy. This dog had an enucleation of its right eye months previously. Canine, morphological diagnosis. Focal, intestinal, and mesenteric hemangiosarcoma. Canine, morphological diagnosis. Cystic mucinous hypoplasia of the gallbladder. Use the scale and the color as well as the lesion to help you arrive at the proper diagnosis. White standard poodle. Morphological diagnosis. Hemangiosarcoma involving the right atrium and lung lobes. 
as well as part of the right ventricle. That one is hard to see. The location here would tell you that this is hemangiosarcoma, blood, not melanin. The right auricular involvement is the key to helping you differentiate metastatic melanoma from disseminated hemangiosarcoma. It would be very unusual to have metastatic melanoma occurring in the right atrium in the form of the lesion that you see in this picture. Cat. What is the condition? nuclei in much of the cerebellar cortex, the folia, yellow. The condition, Kern icterus. This cat had intrahepatic obstructive jaundice from exposure to RAID and had a very high serum bilirubin level. Surgical specimen from a dog. Morphological diagnosis. The audience, I'm sure, is very aware at this time that a key to all of these codochromes to this part of the presentation is color. It is one of the keys. This yellow pan spherical mass is associated with skin that is mainly hairless, and it came from the perineum. It could have come from any area posterior to the umbilicus. And we even saw one dog that had three of these over the shoulders, but that was the only case where this particular tumor was located on the anterior one half of the body. And the color would tell you that you should consider very strongly a tumor of circumanal gland. And its shape and well demarcation would strongly suggest that it would be benign. So my morphological diagnosis would be adenoma of circumanal gland. The color does somewhat suggest the possibility of mast cell tumor, but its discreteness it certainly does not. Surgical specimen, again, removed from a dog. Morphological diagnosis. Cystic mass involving the dermis and probably extending into the subcutis, and the syringe shows a cloudy, probably watery content. The smoothness and thinness of the wall and the contents, indicative of only one lesion, and that is a cystic African gland. If there was somewhere within the wall, a nodule, a proliferation of tissue, then you would have to consider a cystic adenoma or possibly a cystic adenocarcinoma of African gland. Canine, I shouldn't say canine, it's an adjective. Dog, morphological diagnosis,
many of you know what organ this is? Just raise your hand quickly. Good. Color then tells you that this should be a cortical tumor of the adrenal. You cannot decide whether it's benign or malignant. The cortex of this gland, the color, is very similar to the color of the mass. Canine, dog, morphological diagnosis. Multifocal metastatic melanoma to the adrenal. That is black. That cannot be blood. Cat morphological diagnoses. Two. Two morphological diagnoses. Hepatomegaly, diffuse hepatic fatty change. of organs from a dog. Three morphological diagnoses. Two adrenals, one with a mass that occupies most of the medulla, not all of it, and its color, a tan to brownish, would suggest a theochromocytoma, as would the location. While the location of this tumor in the opposite adrenal might suggest to you a theochromocytoma or a metastatic tumor uh, to the adrenal. Its color would strongly suggest it was a cortical tumor. And there's one other key observation to indicate that it's a functional cortical tumor. So the third part of your answer would be atrophy of the adrenal cortices. So that was a functional adrenal cortical tumor. I don't know if it's benign or malignant. Based on what I see here. How well can you see this slide? The lights should be turned down if that's possible. I think I'm going to help you with this because I don't think you can see it well enough. Down here are some chordae tendinae. So there are a variety of changes involving the atrium. And I think from your experience, you probably would guess this would be the left atrium. Thank you. Very good. Left atrium. And then you could make a morphological diagnosis as multiple mural atrial thrombi. 
there are areas of hemorrhage within the endocardium and beneath the endocardium of the atrium, as well as at the attachment of the valve uh, to the wall. But what is very important is that the entire atrial endocardium is blotchy. And one of the colors is this white to white yellow tissue. This is area of necrosis and mineralization and leukocytic infiltrate. And those are the three reasons why uh, we have a white-yellow discoloration of the atrium. The condition would be uremic endocardiosis. Usually, uremic endocardiosis is seen in dogs. I've never seen it in a cat. In dogs that have a very rapid progression of the uremic state. So we have here as morphological diagnoses, and sometimes in examination, they will ask you for tissue alterations. So you would record hemorrhage of the left atrium, multifocal mural thrombi, that's a tissue alteration, and necrosis and mineralization of the atrium. A six-month-old dog. Two morphological diagnoses. Remember, if there is no scale in the photograph, use the photograph as your control. Compare sizes of known or estimated organs with the area or organ that you are concerned about. Once you have done that, in this case, you'd have a very strong feeling that there was hypoplasia, smallness of the liver. There is also an obvious greenish color to the liver. So there's hepatic cholestasis. And there's a yellow discoloration of the fat, especially in the abdomen. So jaundice, which would go along with the liver color. The liver, in this case, was 1.6% of the body weight of this young dog that had periods of CNS signs. And as you would guess, there would be some type of portal shunt. It may not be a portal cable shunt, but there'd be some type of portal shunt so that much of the blood from the abdomen would bypass the liver. Dog, morphological diagnosis. Last several years, I have, at the ACP meetings, sat in on a review of the previous year's examination, as far as the gross portion of the exam is concerned. And I know from my experience listening to those who grade such quizzes, that they would accept, in this case, metastatic melanoma or disseminated hemangiosarcoma. And on a percentage basis, you and I know that disseminated hemangiosarcoma would be far more likely, and that the lesion here is certainly compatible with it, and that's what this one happened to be. Surgical specimen removed from the thorax of a dog. Etiology. When etiology is asked for, you should be as specific as possible.
so red worms won't do? <laughs> Answer would be spiral circa lupi. This worm, which is red, is certainly not Diaclophyma renale, which is a giant red worm and has been found, of course, in the kidney and even in the uterus and peritoneal cavity, but has never, to my knowledge, been found within the thorax. So spiral circuit lupi caused this esophageal nodule that was successfully removed and the dog became asymptomatic. Its regurgitation stopped. Cat, morphological diagnosis, renal infarct. Obviously, the kidney on your right. So when paired organs are shown, sometimes one of those is shown to serve as a control for you. Dog, morphological diagnosis, more is the key. In fact, it's the only key. Your answer would be renal hemoglobin pigmentation. You're awful tempted to say hemoglobinuria, but there's no urine here, and you haven't proved it, that there would be hemoglobin in the urine, if you, even if you did see pink or brownish urine. And this dog did receive an incompatible blood transfusion after it had already received two previous blood transfusions. I suppose they'd have to accept myoglobin discoloration as well, at least I would if I was on an examination. But boy, that's very unlikely. Play the percentages. If there's a photograph of a mass on the distal extremity of the radius, of a large breed dog, they want you to say it's an osteosarcoma, even though it might be osteomyelitis, but much less likely. Dog, morphological diagnosis. Your morphological diagnosis reveal what is pictured on the screen? Fully extensive oral subcutaneous and pharyngeal melanoma. And this is the dog that had the metastatic melanoma to the adrenal. Young dog. Most likely etiological agent. canine hepatitis virus, adenovirus 1. In this photograph, we can appreciate splenomegaly, hemoperitoneum, jaundice, 
and a liver that has many highlights indicating that the surface is rough. That liver is not the classical red-brown. That liver is brown-red. Red, because a lot of that is blood, because a lot of the parenchyma, the hepatocytes, no longer there. So this combination is very suggestive of infectious canine hepatitis, adenovirus 1. Even the color of the urine that we can barely see through the translucent urinary bladder would suggest jaundice. Dog. I want an etiological diagnosis. An etiological diagnosis. In other words, the cause and the location has to be mentioned. An etiological diagnosis. And I always tell my people the example I remember to help me, and that's a rabbit with ear mites. Because I can picture that so easily. And the etiological diagnosis is ovic acariasis. Well, this is sinus mycosis. The etiology, the etiology would be based on your experience in veterinary medicine and pathology would be aspergillus species. The color here, the white cottony growth would suggest a fungus, and the grayish, and maybe a slight greenish, but mainly grayish color would suggest that that's the area where the fungus, the mycelium, is producing fruiting bodies. Cat, morphological diagnosis, Can you see the cause? You know by the extent, the depth of this infarct that you should suspect a lobar renal artery being obstructed. If it was the main renal artery, you would see a kidney that was infarcted like one we have seen just a few moments ago. Vessels tend to collapse. So when they stand up like a pencil, there's probably a reason for it such as either disease within its lumen, such as a thrombus, or disease within its wall, such as a form of arterial sclerosis. So this was a focal renal infarct due to thrombosis of a lobar artery in a cat with cardiomyopathy. Morphological diagnosis. Since you only have two choices here this morning, cat or dog, I guess I don't have to tell you it's dog. Bilateral corneal edema. I think if you would have recorded in your mind or on paper this morning, bilateral buthalmus. Enlargement of the globe, I think I would have accepted that. I would not have counted glaucoma, even though it's probably present, because you have to prove there's increased pressure for that diagnosis. Bilateral corneal edema, and the cause here would be either reaction to the old canine uh, hepatitis virus vaccines, type 1, uh, or 
the virulent agent itself. Dog, morphological diagnoses, two. The dog is nine months old. Retention of deciduous teeth, which have been discolored by tetracycline. So tetracycline discoloration and retention of deciduous teeth. One-year-old Siberian Husky. Morphological diagnosis. more, I challenge you to review your answer and does it adequately describe what's on the screen? The color and age and breed are very important in arriving at the morphological diagnosis of a lingual eosinophilic granuloma. I've never seen squamous cell carcinoma in cats under five years of age. And I don't recall, and I've reviewed all those at Angel cats, and I don't recall from memory without reviewing the cases in dogs, but I don't think I can recall a squamous cell carcinoma in dogs under four years of age. The color green is due to the peroxidase, due to the high concentration of eosinophils. And that knowledge might be useful later today. Dog, surgical specimen. Morphological diagnosis. I think the audience deserves help to be fair with this picture. So I'm telling you that a major bronchus has been opened. That is not a pulmonary arterial or venous thrombus. I wish the color would show up a little bit better because that's greenish gray. And it's the color that would suggest to you the presence of eosinophils. And the shape and size of this bronchus would suggest bronchiectasis. And the contents would suggest bronchitis and eosinophilic bronchitis and bronchiectasis. I'm sorry, I cannot honestly give you an explanation for the amount of blood that is present. I'll call it iatrogenic since it was a surgical specimen. from a dog. Your morphological diagnosis. <coughs> and remember, you are expected to play percentages. So don't argue with me what it might be after I give you the answer. Play percentages.
For this multinodular, dermal, subcutaneous, and focally cystic mass has a variety of colors. And that's a key. But this color is also a very important observation. This white yellow. There's no blood in that. So that's necrotic tissue. In fact, it's coagulation necrosis. Most of that is composed of ghost or shadow cells. So I, I would be willing to bet that that would be either a hair matrix tumor or a trichoepithelioma. And of course, the trichoepithelioma has both an abundance of hair matrix cells as well as stratified squamous cells that form the upper part of hair follicles. A pure hair matrix tumor would be com composed of only hair matrix cells. Many of them, in most cases, have undergone coagulation necrosis because they have grown too far away from their blood supply. Canine, surgical specimen, morphological diagnosis. This too is a dermal and subcutaneous multilobulated mass, but it has one color. Sure, the connective tissue that immediately surrounds the pure white areas, a little bit blue-grayish, suggesting fibrosis. But this, in contrast to the previous picture, is of one color. And calcinosis circumscripta is the only answer that I would accept. Two-month-old Great Dane. Morphological diagnosis. diffuse purulent dermatitis. If I asked you for the condition, you would have said pyoderma. Maybe some of the older folks here might have said canine strangles. I don't like that for many reasons. One the most important is that this is almost always a staph, not a strep. And most of the lesion is due to a severe hypersensitivity to the staph. And I can remember uh, the 10 years that I was in the clinics from 60 to 70, in which we used strictly antibiotics because we cultured staph. And there was obvious pus in the follicles and pustules. And we never thought of using corticosteroids in those years. We even had show dogs given up because they would be scarred for life. But then it's amazing what the response is when you use the appropriate antibiotic and corticosteroids together. So this really is a manifestation of a severe staph hypersensitivity as well as infection. German Shepherd. What is the most likely etiology? What is the most likely etiology? If you were to have a closer view of the skin in these areas, or if you were to part the very thinly haired regions, you would recognize there'd be multiple abrasions. Now, with that added information, please give me the most likely etiology. In this case, the dermatitis and partial alopecia be associated with pruritus. The head is obviously involved, and that's where sarcopy scabii often starts. An old Boston.
interior. I want three morphological diagnoses and the most likely pathogenesis. I want three morphological diagnoses and the most likely pathogenesis. cutaneous hyperpigmentation and a swelling in the inguinal or ventroabdominal region that appears to be subcutaneous, so a subcutaneous swelling. And putting these three observations together, especially if you knew this was a male dog and you'd suspect that without me telling you, that you would suspect a Satoli cell tumor, cryptorchid, in the inguinal region, producing significant estrogen, causing an endocrine dermatopathy. So you start off in your pathogenesis with a cryptorchid testicle, Satoli cell tumor, hyperestrogenism, and endocrine dermatopathy. Surgical specimen, dog, morphological diagnosis. quickly doing an anatomical survey of a dog's body and you conclude from that survey that this lesion, this area is compatible with a foot pad. And you recognize some phalanges, there's one here and the other one here you cannot see very well. But there is an obviously conical mass that's sharply demarcated in the basal region and it has these stria. I would have accepted a cutaneous papilloma of the toe or a cutaneous horn because the fronds, the papillae, are very closely packed together, giving the shape of a horn rather than a, a multi-papillary mass. You can find cutaneous papillomas anywhere in a dog. We only have one cutaneous papilloma since 1946 in a cat. Dog, morphological diagnosis. interstitial cell tumor. The high lipid content, the color, and the blood-filled spaces are the two keys to arriving at the proper diagnosis in contrast to other testicular tumors of the dog. Dog, morphological diagnosis, Play percentages. I have been on occasion fooled by such a lesion as you see on the screen. This is testicular seminoma. It is multilobulated, yes, but I do not appreciate any bands of collagen passing through these lobules. It's relatively smooth and bulging. In a Satoli cell tumor, the color would be compatible, but the very irregular bulging surface due to connective tissue bands is not present here. This is a multilobular pattern rather than a pattern of fibrous trabeculae. Two morphological 
pathological diagnoses, dog. cell tumor of one testicle left and atrophy of the right testicle. You have a scale, but also you have a built-in scale when you compare the size of the epididymis with the testis proper. The epididymis, epididymis to testis proper ratio is way out of proportion. And in the presence of a normal cord, and a normal color and contour to the epididymis, this must be a small testis proper rather than a big epididymis. And of course, it goes along nicely with a functional Sertoli cell tumor. Dog, morphological diagnosis. Gee, there's no way that I would expect you to know this was a testicle, but it's the same testicle. But I'm using it to illustrate the very fibrous and rough and fibrous component of this very large tumor. Some pathologists say any tumor of the testicle that's that size is a Sertoli cell tumor. It doesn't have to be. But most of the tumors that are very large and greatly distort the contour of the testicle, most of those, most of those are Sertoli cell tumors. Dog, morphological diagnosis. discoloration and distortion and enlargement of the epididymis. The color and the distortion would suggest inflammation. The nodular enlargement of the vas deferens would also suggest inflammation. So the morphological diagnoses would be an epididymitis and a vasitis, inflammation of the vas deferens. And I would have to accept uh, Visceral vaginitis as well. This was due to staphylococcus. Specimen from a dog. Please ignore the artifact, the scratches on the film. Morphological diagnosis. Multifocal granulomas of the epididymis of the sperm variety. The color is so compatible with that. So multiple sperm granulomas of the epididymis. There are many ways of saying the same thing correctly. Name the condition, <coughs> same thing. Tetanus. Look at those ears stand up. That dog was constantly alert. <laughs> Are you awake this morning? What is your morphological diagnosis? Uh, 
I think you have, you know the significance of looking at the entire photograph. I can remember an example where one year at the examination, the answer, the diagnosis was on the screen by mistake, and some of the people taking the exam missed it. <laughs> it's true. Okay, it says L, probably meaning left. So there's situs inversus abdominis. The duodenum is on the wrong side. The gallbladder is on the wrong side. The bulk of the liver is on the wrong side. The greater curvature of the stomach is pointing in the wrong direction. Incidental finding in this case. Dog, morphological diagnosis. You have two pictures. This is the first one. The second. Morphological diagnosis. Bilateral, papillary, adenocarcinoma of the ovaries. And if you for orientation, kidneys, ovarian masses, uterine horns, body, cervix, cervix down here. If you would have include bilateral cystic and papillary endocarcinoma, of course it would be right. And chances are the fluid would be serous, so if you said bilateral cystic, serous, papillary adenocarcinoma, you would be 100% right in a very definitive type of diagnosis. In most cases, when you find an adenocarcinoma of one ovary, there will be an adenocarcinoma of yeah. for recording, taping. Yeah. Yes. I know that you are awake now because you've heard Dr. John King speak. I also know that if you are warmed up, therefore you no longer have 15 seconds, you have 10. <laughs> We left off with bilateral papillary cyst adenocarcinoma of the ovaries of the dog. Cat. Morphological diagnosis. Two. One would be unilateral ovarian mass, and two would be enlarged uterus. It's cat. It's a mass that has a relatively smooth, not a papillary surface. And from experience, the autopsy table, surgical table, and from reading, you know that the most common ovarian tumor of the cat in contrast with that of the dog, is the granulosa cell tumor. No matter what the ovarian tumor is, whether it's an adenocarcinoma, or granulosa cell tumor, or luteoma, there will be some endometrial hyperplasia. There may or may not be endometritis. So this is a classical picture of a unilateral granulosa cell tumor with cystic endometrial hyperplasia. I know that, but you, you don't. The microscope revealed that there was no endometritis present. In a normal setting, the hormones that leave the ovary leave the left ovary by way of the ovarian vein that empties into the left renal vein and the right ovary directly into the posterior vena cava. In both cases, the hormones pass directly on their way to the pituitary without being metabolized by the liver. So there is a normal feedback shutdown situation. Two of our granulosa cell tumors in cats developed in ectopic ovarian tissue. 
ovarian tissue that was accidentally <coughs> dropped back into the abdominal cavity during ovarian hysterectomy. In other words, a small fragment of ovary implanted and grew. Now, the hormones that that ovary, ovarian tissue produced went by way of the portal vein eventually to the liver and was metabolized and the pituitary says, hey, low values of estrogen, therefore the pituitary produced lots of gonadotropic hormone, powerful stimulating hormone. And I think that is the pathogenesis of granulosa cell tumor from ectopic ovarian tissue created at the time of spaying. Dog, morphological diagnosis. carcinoma of the lung, we have a solitary, large pulmonary mass located out toward the periphery, a most classical example of primary lung tumor. In man, the most classical example would be one involving the major bronchi at the hilus rather than out at the periphery because in man, that's usually a squamous cell carcinoma, secondary to squamous metaplasia, and the typical reactions or changes within the epithelium uh, lining the major airways. But in the dog, it's more apt to be a papillary adenocarcinoma. Certainly your answer for bronchial, bronchiolar alveolar cell carcinoma would also be counted correct. Morphological diagnoses. One would be bilateral exudative rhinitis, and two would be enamel hypoplasia. You can see that there's normal enamel near the crowns of the incisor teeth, but down here there's yellow tan discoloration and if you're as, as close as I am, you can see that there's pitting. So enamel hypoplasia, bilateral exudative rhinitis, the cause would be paramyxovirus canine distemper. Morphological diagnosis. recognize chyloscosis, also known as hair lip, and the most common lesion associated with hair lip is a cleft palate, palatoscosis. Some people say paloscysis, but that's incorrect. Morphological diagnosis. of the eye. I would not expect you to know whether it was a corneal dermoid or whether it was on the conjunctiva of the third eyelid. In this case, it was on the conjunctiva of the third eyelid. And you can see the mass as well as some hair projecting from that ocular dermoid. Morphological diagnosis. Cutaneous and oral papillomatosis. Or if you want to say cutaneous and oral viral papillomatosis, fine. The ventrum of a cat. Morphological diagnosis.
the skin has been incised and you recognize the glistening gray material that separates the lobules of fat more so than it should. Therefore, there is fluid present, subcutaneous edema. This five-month-old cat had glomerular nephritis and anasarca. <coughs> pathogenesis, the most likely pathogenesis. have to start either with a functional ACTH producing pituitary tumor or with a primary adrenal cortical functional tumor or I suppose an unusual case of excessive iatrogenic administration of corticosteroids but it's hypercortical stir uh, hypercortical steroid condition in which the level is such that manifestations manifestations such as alopecia and a pennulous abdomen and weakness of the ligaments and tendons is the result of this excess cortisone production. So the skin reveals an endocrine dermatopathy mainly characterized by alopecia. I do not see calcinosis cutis in this case. Another dog. What is the condition? I think you recognize that it's a male dog. It's gynecomastia, pennulus prepuce, and alopecia. The condition is hyperestrogenism. And the most likely cause, of course, would be a functional Sertoli cell tumor. Morphological diagnosis. Multiple cysts of ceruminous glands. Some of them might be cystic adenomas of ceruminous glands, but chances are all of them would be cysts of ceruminous glands. A morphological diagnosis, and then I would like you to give me the condition. A morphological diagnosis, and then give me a condition. It's a multifocal, papular, and exudative dermatitis with some degree of alopecia. The condition would be mirrory eczema or flea bite allergic dermatitis. Do you catch the difference between a condition and a morphological diagnosis? A morphological diagnosis, dog. alopecia. I'm well, sure there's some type of abrasion here as well, or ulcer of the skin, but generalized alopecia. And in this case, it's not an endocrine dermatopathy. In this case, the dog had ingested low levels of thallium sulfate over a long period of time. Dog, morphological diagnosis. I 
think most of you realize we're looking at the inner aspect of the thigh. The knee would be up here somewhere. The hip would be up here. Morphological diagnosis is enlargement and discoloration of the sciatic nerve and its branches. What would be the cause? What would be the specific lesion? If there is a bird, you would think in terms of glucosis. It's in a dog, it could be lymphosarcoma. But if the same lesion involving the sciatic nerve involved the brachial plexus, you wouldn't hesitate at all to say a neurofibroma. And that's what this was, neurofibroma, the sciatic nerve. Corgi. Corgi breed of dog. Morphological diagnosis. If you read the 1982 or 1983 issues of veterinary pathology, you would recognize this lesion as renal telangiectasia of the corgi. It's been seen in coyotes, and in my experience, only in the corgi breed. Of course, it's characterized by hematuria, because these are greatly dilated vascular channels lined by benign endothelium. A surgical specimen removed from the anterior half of the body of a dog of middle age or older. What is your morphological diagnosis? You see this blue-black color involving a cutaneous mass, because I think you can recognize skin here. You would have to consider the possibility of a melanoma, a nevus, in other words, a benign melanogenic tumor, a pigmented basal cell tumor, or a blood-filled lesion such as hemangioma or hemangiosarcoma. Close inspection would reveal no blood-filled spaces, but rather a very irregular bulging cut surface. And this is a good example of a pigmented basal cell tumor. We have seen those, of course, in cats far more frequently. In fact, half of the 93 basal cell tumors of cats that I have looked at microscopically were pigmented. Half also, not necessarily the same tumors, were cystic in the cat, whereas in the dog, very few are pigmented and very, very few are cystic. Surgical specimen from a dog. What is the most likely specific morphological diagnosis? Draw your attention to the color, especially here more so than here. This dermal and subcutaneous mass with its tan or tawny color, it's very poorly demarcated, certainly not encapsulated, would be most likely a mast cell tumor. Morphological diagnosis. You might give me several. Alopecia. But the outstanding one is this region here that is very irregular and mottled and in some areas has white, yellow, I emphasize the yellow material. 
And this is calcinosis cutis and alopecia in a dog with hyperadrenal corticism. <coughs> a normal on your left, a five month old cat, morphological diagnoses two. Fibrous osteodystrophy, and of course it's apt to be nutritious. Nutritional <coughs> secondary hyperparathyroidism would be a condition. The morphological diagnosis is fibrous osteodystrophy. Now second diagnosis would be a healing folding fracture with an abundant subperiosteal bone proliferation. Autopsy specimen from an old dog. Morphological diagnosis. Ten seconds up. Chondral sarcoma arising from one or more ribs. Very likely from one rib. The important thing here is for you to remember this glistening, glassy, grayish blue tissue. That's cartilage. Looks like articular cartilage. Certainly within this mass, a pathologist might find foci of neoplastic osteoid. Then the diagnosis by convention, not by the abundance of tissue, by convention, where you make the diagnosis on the tissue that is more apt to be ma most malignant. Well, an osteosarcoma is regarded as a more malignant tumor than a chondral sarcoma. But as we view this specimen, we should say at the growth level that this is most likely a chondral sarcoma. This is another specimen a surgical specimen. The sternum, a sternum bra, is here. What is your morphological diagnosis? Shiny, glistening, gray, blue tissue. Again, tremendous amount of cartilage. So let us call it a chondral sarcoma until proved otherwise. Two-year-old German Shepherd. What is the lesion? What is the primary lesion? The primary morphological diagnosis. So one may be serving as a control for the other. Not necessarily so. But this one on your left is normal. The lesion here is osteochondrosis desiccans of the lateral femoral condyle. And as a result of this lesion, of course the fat here is going to be more red and more yellow brown due to hemosiderin than the fat in the normal joint. And there will be early osteoarthritis, degenerative joint disease. Primary lesion, osteochondrosis desiccans. Lesion developed in a two-year-old cat. Morphological diagnosis. That shiny tissue. Looks like articular cartilage. And here is kind of grayish blue. That's because this osteochondroma is capped by cartilage. And underneath the cartilaginous cap is benign bone. 
And somewhere that benign bone with its medullary tissue communicates with the medulla of the parent bone. In cats, osteochondromas can arise in mature animals after the skeleton ceases to grow. This is in contrast with those in dogs. And in contrast, those in dogs, cats with osteochondromatosis, more than one growth, most of those are feline leukemia virus positive. Cat, two morphological diagnoses. fracture and loss of the femoral neck, and pseudoarthrosis. You can tell by the smooth contour that the body was attempting to make a new joint. A 10-month-old German Shepherd, morphological diagnoses, two, please. Outstanding observations. One is that there's erosion of the femoral head, and two is a very thick, opaque joint capsule. So we have evidence of degenerative joint disease. Do we see a cause? Well, I don't know what the cause is, but I see something associated with it. See, this tissue was not cut with a knife. See how relatively smooth this is? This German Shepherd had bilateral ruptures of the round ligament, the femoral head, and of course bilateral degenerative joint disease. It also had bilateral ununited ankle knee processes, so elbows and hips. I wish I did understand the pathogenesis. Morphological diagnosis. Cranial osteopathy, osteopathy. If we had the cranium involved, I'd say cranial and temporal mandibular osteopathy. Most commonly seen in the Scotty, the West Highland White Terrier, the Cairn Terrier, but can be seen in, in larger breeds as well on occasion. On my way out here, I read one of the recent AHA issues and they reported about 15 cases of someone from Texas, I'm sorry I don't remember the person or people's names, reported 15 cases of a patazone infection in dogs from the southeastern border of Texas. And half of those dogs had this proliferative reaction very similar to what you would see with this condition of unknown cause. With a patazone canis infection, they showed pictures where the vertebral column, and the pelvis, the ribs were involved, as well as distal long bones that would make you think of hypertrophic osteopathy, which is associated with pulmonary lesions and thoracic wall lesions. Dog, morphological diagnosis. recognize that this is an anterior view of the proximal humerus. This tissue is brown and proliferative, shouldn't be here, and you get the feeling that it's probably quite hard, and it was mainly bone. 
So this is degenerative joint disease or osteoarthropathy, whichever you choose, of the humerus in relationship with the bicipital groove. So no doubt this dog had bicipital bursitis as well. So I would have accepted chronic bicipital bursitis as well as degenerative joint disease. As long as you recognize it was the, the bicipital groove that is the main point of the lesion. Dog, morphological diagnosis. Morphological diagnosis is subperiosteal bone proliferation of the radius and ulna. The condition is hypertrophic osteopathy. It used to be called hypertrophic pulmonary osteopathy, but since there are conditions in which the lungs themselves do not contain the main lesion, for example, such as chondrosarcoma of the rib cage, uh, most people are dropping the pulmonary component of that condition. Morphological diagnosis. This is dog, a basset hound. It's the same. In this case, the animal did have an osteosarcoma primary to the lung. Young dog, we know it's young, don't we? What is the condition? I probably would accept any one of about three, if I can remember the three answers. Panosteitis eosinophilic periostitis, or anastosis. And those three terms tell you a little bit about the condition. Many will not. There is subperiosteal bone proliferation, so that would be a morphological diagnosis. Another morphological diagnosis would be anastosis. Here we have fibrous connective tissue and benign bone replacing hematopoietic tissue. When a pathologist interprets bone lesions, one should also look at the radiographs if possible. Two morphological diagnoses, young dog. Focal or disseminated pulmonary hemorrhages, or you could say disseminated petechiae and ecchymoses, and jaundice. This dog had infectious canine hepatitis, which of course is an endotheliotropic virus, so it stands to reason why there is hemorrhage. I didn't bring along with me today a very classical uh, picture of diffuse hemorrhage of the brain stem of dogs with infectious canine hepatitis, a slide that has been seen by groups of people in the past. Young dog, morphological diagnosis. Diffuse hepatic necrosis. Why do I say that with confidence? You see the highlights? It's very pitted, it's collapsed. And this liver is too red. And it has fibrin on its capsule. So this is another good example of diffuse hepatic necrosis. And this was the liver from the same dog that you saw the thoracic cavity a moment ago. It had infectious canine hepatitis. 
too red and pitted, generalized. Dog, etiology. Morphological diagnosis would be diffuse, severe, proliferative pleuritis with exudate containing sulfur granules. In this case, actinomyces vulvis, or at least actinomyces species, nocardia would have to be accepted. If this was the thorax of a cat, then I put my money on these counties being bacterial counties of a mixed type, neither containing actinomyces or nocardia. That's a percentage statement I have given you. So all sulfur granules are not composed of a, necessarily of a single type of bacterium. A five-year-old Boston Terrier Morphological diagnoses and the most likely specific morphological diagnosis. Two morphological diagnoses and the most likely specific morphological diagnosis. Splenomegaly, hepatomegaly with pale discoloration, but hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. When you see a spleen with that color, you should think of what type of neoplasm? Mast cell tumor. So you do an imprint and try to dis distinguish whether they're lymphocytes or mast cells. That should be easy. Four-month-old German Shepherd. Morphological diagnosis. The primary morphological diagnosis. Persistent right fourth aortic arch. You can see that the esophagus has been compressed, constricted, with megaesophagus involving the proximal portion. disease. Most of these lesions are round. They're not rectangular or triangular. So many of them don't look like true infarcts. Some of them certainly be compatible with an infarct. Look at this one. Goes all the way across, sharp demarcation. So we have lesions, some of which are infarcts, and others don't appear to be infarcts. And the latter is the key. These would be more apt to, most apt to be pyogranulomas due to FIP, feline infectious peritonitis. So there is a vasculitis and, and uh, thrombosis and infarction, yes. Dog most likely specific morphological diagnosis. Nodular lymphocytic hypoplasia. Dog, morphological diagnosis.
same case. Nodular lymphocytic hyperplasia. Dog, most likely morphological diagnosis. This time the mass is very dark, very blue purple, suggesting lots of blood, not lots of lymphocytes. It's not a pale mass like the previous case that we saw on the natural surface. And since it's a single and rather large mass, chances are it's a hematoma of the spleen. Dog, never saw it in a cat. Dog, morphological diagnosis. Splenic fibrociderotic capsular plaques, gamma gandhi bodies, fibrociderosis, the capsule of the spleen. Old dog. These two lesions, and the one that was removed, you can see the nylon sutures, are most likely what type of tumor? You want help? There's the cut surface. The cirrhosal surface is here. The mucosa, if you were there, could with a gloved finger slide the mucosa over these masses. They're white, and I think you get the idea in some areas that they're a little bit bulging, irregular, and your diagnosis would be lyomyomas. A rather classical location, by the way. If I had to choose one location in the stomach of dogs, I would choose the area um, near the esophagus. What two most likely conditions are associated with this lesion in the cat? What two conditions are most likely associated with this lesion in the cat. Well, we have diffuse fatty change and we also have some subcapsular fractures probably from clinicians palpating the living cat. It's a very friable liver when there's this much fat present. The conditions would be diabetes uh, mellitus, or hepatic lipidosis of unknown cause, but of course associated with periods of anorexia. Cat, morphological diagnosis. A natural and a cut surface, so probably one kidney, so it's polycystic kidney. Very few cats live beyond five years before they become uremic with this condition. Dog, what is the most likely specific morphological diagnosis? I know it's a splenic mass. I want a specific diagnosis. I show this in repetition just because I think it was the largest benign nodule of lymphocytic hyperplasia that I have seen. This is a, about a 15 centimeter ruler and a cut surface, rather discreet, bulging, and the color would certainly suggest the possibility of leukocytes, and in this location, lymphocytes. Dog. I would like you to consider what three possible types of renal disease could be responsible for this lesion. Well, what is this lesion? We are talking about a pale kidney that is not scarred. It has a smooth contour. It's not small. Possibly on cut surface, it would bulge. It's not small. In which of those three conditions that you have mentally written down do you think would be most likely? 
Here's the cut surface. Not red brown, very pale. And then some of these are highlights. See, these are highlights. But darn it, some of these are not highlights. These are pale spots. And when you can see tiny pale spots, chances are they're going to be glomeruli. Or well, sure, they might be foci and mineralization. But if they are glomeruli and you'd want to check, you'd first do an iodine stain and then the pale white foci become brown, amyloid. So the answer to the original question, you think of renal amyloidosis, you think of glomerular nephritis, and you think of severe diffuse nephrosis, responsible for a pale kidney of normal contour. Cat, morphological diagnosis. Cranial mediastinal and caudal cervical, because it's gone through the thoracic inlet, lymphosarcoma. Cat. Two morphological diagnoses. likely caused. Here's where reading and experience is necessary. Morphological diagnoses would be endophthalmitis. Not only is there hypopion or at least some type of exudate in the anterior chamber, there's a tremendous amount of exudate between the detached retina, another morphological diagnosis, and the choroid and sclera. So endophthalmitis, if the sclera was involved, and I knew that, then I would have said panophthalmitis, but I don't know that. So endophthalmitis and retinal detachment, and you'd have to consider FIP, uh, cryptococcosis. I don't know what I'd put third in the cat. About a one-month-old cat. Morphological diagnosis, and you give me the breed. <coughs> this the breed was a Manx cat. And this mass was protruding into the pelvic canal. Most meningeal seals, and if they have the spinal cord participating in the mass, as this one does, then it's a meningeal myelo seal. Most of those in Manx cats go dorsally. And there's often an associated fistula or depression in the sacral region, but not in this cat. This meningeal myelo seal was ventral. So malformation of the vertebral column would be another morphological diagnosis. Two-year-old cat, morphological diagnosis. This is a hepatic biliary cyst. In the 60s, I successfully removed this huge cyst that extended as far back as the urinary bladder. I had to remove one and a half lobes of liver in order to remove the cyst. Dog, morphological diagnosis. The lighting isn't good, so I'll quickly help you. I doubt that you need that much help but there's a solitary renal cyst. Photograph is too dark. Photograph is excellent. <laughs> what is 
your morphological diagnosis. Ten seconds passes in a hurry. Disseminated hemangial sarcoma with splenic, hepatic, cardiac, and pulmonary, and even all mental lesions. <clears throat> a four-month-old dog died of heart failure. Most likely cause It's normal to see fat around coronary vessels. It's not normal to see fat out here at the apex of the left ventricle. Fat gradually disappears as you go toward the apex. So this is not fat. This pallor is due to fibrosis and loss of muscle. Probably at four months, there'd be very few inflammatory cells still left from the previous episode of severe parvoviral myocarditis. So canine parvo, uh, parvovirus would be the cause. Canine, two morphological diagnoses, and I'm not counting cardiomegaly as one, although I, I could. Since there's a double apex, there has to be right ventricular enlargement. And we can see diophiloriasis, heartworms, the condition diophiloriasis. So there's probably enlargement of the main pulmonary artery as well. But the two outstanding uh, findings would be enlargement of the right ventricle and heartworms. Throughout the four hours of my presentation, you will be personally quizzed as to whether or not you're learning anything as we go along. From both what Dr. King said and what I have said previously, the most common cause of this change, mural thrombi, hemorrhage, and this mineralization, see these white yellow elevations, would be uremic endocardiosis. Morphological diagnosis, dog. Supernumerary corneal, uh, coronary vascular, vascularization, coronary vessels. Way too many of them. Have any of you ever seen this before? No hands. So a congenital anomaly consisting of excess number of coronary vessels. Most likely breed, four month old dog. German Shepherd, morphological diagnoses. The primary one is subaortic stenosis. And as a result of the stenosis, there's aortic aneurysm and of course, left ventricular hypertrophy. Dog, six years old, <coughs> kind of unusual. Dog, morphological diagnosis, and we have the main pulmonary artery here another pulmonary artery going to this lung, and then there's a communication here with the aorta. So it's a patent ductus arteriosus. And when it's opened, we can recognize the main pulmonary artery. You can see a pulmonary artery going to the opposite lung, one going to this side. And then look at the size of this um, ductus. 
And of course, there's aneurysm of the aorta. Cat, what is the condition? And then give me the morphological diagnoses. What is the condition? What is the disease called, in other words? The condition is called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The morphological diagnoses would be hypertrophy of the left ventricle. Look at the prominence of these papillary muscles and how small the chamber would, is, how small the chamber is. Then, of course, there's a large neural left atrial thrombus and possibly two thrombi. I believe there would have to be two if this photograph is representative of the condition. Morphological diagnoses. Photograph is too dark to show the small chamber. I think you can appreciate that there's left ventricular hypertrophy. I wish there was a scale here to show you that the left ventricular free wall was greater than 0.8 centimeters in thickness to definitely prove to you that there was left hy ventricular hypertrophy. But the outstanding and rare lesion in this cat is not the uh, heart as much as it is the aorta. Normally when you cut an aorta, it tends to fold back together again, or at least be, have a smooth contour. This thing collapses as if it's composed of plaques. And yes, it is arteriosclerosis. This uh, cat did have renal failure, it did have on two profiles elevated cholesterol, and the owner was giving vitamins, multiple vitamins. So what did vitamin D and the cholesterol and the uremia together created this very rare lesion of arteriosclerosis? Uh, I don't know, but I suspect there is a relationship. German Shepherd, young dog playing in the backyard and died suddenly. <coughs> Morphological diagnosis. Next 10 dog autopsies, cut the heart in different ways. Get a feel as to the anatomy of a heart. If you consistently open a heart one way, I think you kind of lose some of this 3D uh, feeling for the heart. This heart was open in our usual way, but the free wall, the left ventricle, was elevated, the septal wall down here with the papillary muscles here, so it was elevated before we opened the aorta. So this is sub aortic stenosis. This is a very dense fibrous ring located just beneath the aortic valve. Very classical for the lesion if you look at it in this way. Dog, morphological diagnosis. This was a hematocyst. This, I think, is the only left AV valvular hematocyst I've seen in the dog. And my other uh, experiences have been with the right AV valve. Cat. Photograph's a little bit too dark, but I think you can appreciate the banding here and the rigidity. You can't palpate a photograph, but you still, in some cases, can get a feel for the consistency just through observation. So the banding, most prominent in the left subclavian artery. In the dog, three morphological diagnoses. The 
most obvious is an endocardial tear of the left atrium. There's also some scarring, some fibrosis at that site. There is left AV valvular myxomatosis. There's also hemorrhage. There are many morphological diagnoses here. I think you would, represent, uh, would agree with me from the size and color of this quarter tendon that it, and very likely that one, since there's no connection to the papillary muscles, represents ruptured chordae tendony. And as Dr. King pointed out to us about the color of tissues, we recognize that this myocardium as seen through a normal endocardium, very thin, transparent, is mottled. So there has to be something wrong with the muscle. And the muscle is in various stages of degeneration slash necrosis. So there is multifocal myocardial necrosis. No wonder there is a left atrial endocardial tear. When did that happen? It happened when the chordae tendony ruptured. Dog. Three morphological diagnoses. Probably the most obvious would be dilatation of the left atrium. But very strikingly, we have a ruler. There's also left ventricular hypertrophy and another left atrial endocardial split or tear. And yes, a very common lesion in dogs is left atrial ventricular valvular endocardiosis. Dog, two morphological diagnoses. common left atrial ventricular valvular endocardiosis, myxomatosis and fibrosis is endocardiosis of the valve. And then there is verrucous vegetative valvular, left AV valvular endocarditis. This is just a blood clot that wasn't cleaned out prior to the photograph. Morphological diagnosis, dog, and most likely breed. I'm asking you to ignore the valvulitis of the aortic cusp, inflammation and thickening, opacification of the aortic cusp. So the morphological diagnosis is a heart-based tumor that's been cut here and here. Of course, this piece would fit back together and boxer would be the most likely breed. Of course, I've even seen it recently in the German Shepherd, so it's not just Boston Terriers and boxers. Dog, morphological diagnosis. Normally, coronary vessels collapse after death. These are patchy, white yellow, and distended. It's atherosclerosis of the coronary vessels. And maybe from the rigidity of these vessels, you also assume, and also the plaque-like appearance, the patchy appearance of the pulmonary artery would indicate that there's also arteriosclerosis there as well. And the color would indicate it's atherosclerosis type of arteriosclerosis. And yes, this dog was hypothyroid. Dog, morphological diagnosis. Myocardial infarct of the right ventricle possibly ictrus as well.
hat. Morphological diagnosis. What is responsible for the modeling of the ventricular septum and the marked thickening and discoloration of the atrium? Atrium in that location would probably be a millimeter or less in thickness. Your answer? Lymphosarcoma of the heart. Morphological diagnoses, canine. Is this dog Hickrick? Yes. What is responsible for the discoloration, patchiness of the left atrium? This represents necrosis, mineralization, and a leukocytic infiltrate. This is one of the earliest manifestations of uremic endocarditis of the left atrium. <laughs> 